Hello everyone, this is Anuradha Sharma and you are watching my channel Eyes with Anuradha. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a telephone conversation between a hotel receptionist and a customer. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, Sunset Hotel. How may I help you? Good morning. I just saw an advert in the paper about your hotel. Where exactly is it located? We are situated on Sunset Avenue, north of the beach close to many scenic spots. It is an ideal choice for travellers interested in sightseeing. The receptionist says the hotel is situated north of the beach, so north has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Sunset Hotel. How may I help you? Good morning. I just saw an advert in the paper about your hotel. Where exactly is it located? We are situated on Sunset Avenue, north of the beach, close to many scenic spots. It is an ideal choice for travellers interested in sightseeing. That's great. Is there a vacant four-bed room? We'll be travelling with our two sons, age 9 and 11, so it's best that we are able to stay in one room. Let me check. Just a moment. Um, we only have a few four-bed rooms, and I'm afraid they are fully booked at the moment. The earliest time available is August, but there might be some left in July if a previous customer cancels the reservation. Oh, that'll do. How much would the room cost me? It's... 77 euros 50 during peak time, but the price would be much lower during off-peak season. Only 50 euros. So, if I book a room right now, is there any discount? Yes, we do offer a 30% discount for any reservation made one month ahead of schedule. It is a very reasonable price. That does sound tempting. Does the price include anything? The price includes two breakfast vouchers per room per day. You can use them at two different restaurants in our hotel. There's also a 20-minute spa trial available, but you have to book it beforehand at the concierge or directly at the spa centre. Um, I'm wondering if there is a hair dryer in the room. It takes ages to dry my hair without one. Do I have to bring one? No, there is absolutely no need to bring that, for each room is equipped with a hair dryer. But I have to inform you the towels are not provided. You'll have to bring your own, or hire some at the front desk. Oh, I see. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Before making a reservation, can you tell me a little bit more about your hotel? Sure, no problem. We aim to please our guests by providing impeccable service at all the modern amenities, trying to make them feel at home. In the lounge, there are a list of books, ranging from contemporary literature to classic poetry, Free for any guest to read, there is also a games room offering a number of indoor games, including popular board games like Monopoly, as well as the beloved table soccer. A nice place to go on rainy days. 
Are the computers available in the hotel? I might have a few emails to respond to during my stay there. I'm afraid we currently do not provide any for our customers. However, internet is available within our hotel premises. Just use the room number and the guest name to log in. That means I have to bring my own laptop then. All right. Um, because I'm travelling with my two sons, is there anything that they might be interested in? Yes. A popular activity here for children is collecting shells on the beach. Our hotel has a private beach. When there are very few visitors, you can take a stroll down the beach with your children and enjoy some quality family time undisturbed. That sounds nice, but you see, my boys really love adventure. Is there something more exciting for them to participate in? We do have bicycles ready for hire. You can cycle with the boys along the bush track by the hotel, which is an ideal place to explore the wonders of nature. But because there is only a limited number of bicycles, we apply a first-come, first-served rule. Got it. I think my boys would love it. How can I arrange the payment then? Can I pay by credit card? Of course. We take credit cards. Thank you. You've been a great help. My pleasure, ma'am. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a speech given to new employees at a museum. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 13. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Peter Myers, and on behalf of everybody here at Stevensbridge Dungeons, I would like to welcome you all to our entertainment team. This year, the hiring process was especially competitive, and it might interest you all to know that for every position, there were almost 30 applicants, so you really are the best of the best. In a moment, I will take you on a tour of the museum so you can get an idea of what the space is like. But first of all, I would like to show you around the staff room. Our staff room is located at the back of the building over here. You will notice that there are two entrances to the staff room. One leads to the room we're in now, which is the main and oldest dungeon here at Stevensbridge, which we have turned into the museum. This is where you will greet the new visitors and also where the tour throughout the dungeons will begin. I should mention now that we only ever send visitors through as part of a group. So even on the busy days, you will still get roughly 10 minutes of free time between each group. Make sure you use that time wisely, because you'll need to get straight back into character as soon as it's over. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 14 to 18. Right, follow me and I'll show you the layout of the museum. From the museum, we can pass through this door near the interactive display into the staff room. From here, you can see the steps at the far side in the opposite corner that lead outside into Berwick Street. When you arrive for a shift, it will be much easier for you all to come in the Berwick Street entrance directly down the steps to the staff room. If you come in through the main visitor entrance, it will take you longer to get past security. 
As you can all see, there are lockers on your right-hand side. Uh, they should be big enough for you to put your bags and coats in. You'll get given keys later that work with any of the lockers in here. Over on the other side, past the lockers, is our most exciting area. This is where our wardrobe and makeup will take place. Every shift, you will be transformed from normal people into grotesque medieval prisoners. If you're lucky, you get to be the jailer, but even they rarely bathed in those days. Of course, some of you might consider yourselves method actors, but please do try to shower before your shift. <laughs> We don't want to give visitors an experience that's too authentic. Now, we do have a staff shower here if you really need it. It is located next to the staff toilets, which are unisex. I hope nobody has too much of a problem with that. Unfortunately, dungeons were not really designed with comfort in mind. You can find the bathroom at the other end of the room from the makeup area. There is also another toilet for the public, concealed just to the right of the door into this room. Let's move back into the museum. We have three main sections down here. The first one you pass into when you leave the staff room is the museum. This is where all the useful information can be found such as dates, number of prisoners and the kinds of torture that we used. I know it's a lot of information to take in on your first day, but try to learn as much of it as you can. Even though you'll mostly be in character, visitors might want to ask you some questions and it would be great if you could tell them more about the dungeons. I think it would be more interesting if visitors could learn directly from you rather than having to read about it. As you can see, on the left we have an interactive display for children and on the right we have a photo booth. This was the original dungeon, first built in 1435. Now, let's pass through into the main dungeon that was added during the Tudor period in around 1570. You might be able to feel that the air is a lot damper and cooler here. That is because we are now beneath the River Stevens. This is primarily the room in which most of you will be working. This is where many high-profile religious figures were held, sometimes for years on end. Depending on the roles you'll be playing, you can either be chained up, free to roam, or, if you're a jailer, wandering between prisoners to keep an eye on them. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 19 to 20. Now we will pass into our third and final section, the prison cells. Over here, you can see there are some wooden stocks and a fake gibbet. <laughs> don't worry, I can see a couple of you looking concerned. You don't need to reenact any of the torture scenes for visitors. One person each shift will play the jailer in here, where you will give a speech to the group about some of the more notable prisoners to stay here in the past. This is usually the end of the tour but some visitors will certainly want to ask you more questions at this point, so please try your best to make yourselves available. Help them by answering any questions they have. Also, feel free to guide the visitors through the museum if you see that they're going the wrong way. This concludes our introduction to your new workplace. If you'll please follow me, I will get you all issued with your keys and some information about the dungeons that you can take home with you to study. I will also introduce you to your shift supervisor, Alice Stiles, and you can ask her any questions you may have about your roles. Section 3 you will hear Jim and Jane, two students, talking about their professor's lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Jane, what did you think of Professor Morgan's lecture? I don't know about you, but I find it incredibly difficult to believe that light influences the environment as much as he says. I've never seen any journal articles, websites or anything that verifies his arguments. It's stupid. On the contrary, I've seen a great deal of research supporting his argument from a wide range of renowned scientists. Have you looked at the recommended textbook listed on the course outline given to us at the beginning of the semester? All the information is in there. Perhaps you've just been looking in the wrong places. I never look at the course outlines. I have so many loose sheets of paper I tend to lose anything I'm given by the end of the day. What's the textbook they recommend? And where can I get it from? I should probably go buy it soon. I'm already behind in the course. Yeah, you definitely should buy it. And our grades are more important this year. It's called The Influence of Light on the Environment. You should be able to find it in the bookshop on campus. If not, they'll order it within two weeks. In the meantime, you should read up on Ken Simpson's work. He argues that in order to protect natural habitats, governments should endeavour to turn off lights in cities at night. Well, that's controversial. I doubt any government would be willing to do that any time soon. I imagine roads would become quite dangerous without street lighting. For this issue, Dave Kepler suggests they could just replace the existing lights with more environmentally friendly bulbs. They could even install solar-powered lights. That way, roads will be more eco-friendly while maintaining safety. Although I guess they wouldn't be particularly effective in colder countries, especially during the winter. That's quite a good idea, actually. The price of solar power is supposed to be on par with electricity within the next few decades, and it was on the news this morning. I've also heard that, according to Sharon Gray, in countries with more sunlight, insect-eating animals tend to be smaller in size. Since there are fewer insects, and the remaining insects produced a smaller number of eggs. Yeah, I think I read somewhere that sunlight also has a negative effect on the quality of water, but I'm not sure I believe it. In many hot countries, particularly developing countries, there is a lot of water pollution caused by factories rather than sunlight. Nevertheless, Maria Jackson says that in direct sunlight, the surface of the water becomes more translucent. Therefore, it affects the amount of sunlight that aquatic insects can absorb. Not much research has been undertaken to prove Jackson's theory, but it seems to have been widely accepted anyway. I've never heard of that. I'll have to look it up on Google. The only other theory I've studied is Barbara Swallow's study on how declined insect population adversely affects the frog population. Not that I'm complaining. I hate insects, especially spiders. You have arachnophobia? I never would have guessed. Didn't your brother have a pet black widow spider? Yes, he did, and I hated it. It escaped from its cage once, and we never found it. I had nightmares for months. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. OK, now I'm getting goosebumps. Let's change the subject. What's your stance on natural and artificial light? Honestly, I'm not sure it makes much difference which one you use. Species will die out either way. I think the real argument we should consider is global warming and protection or replacement of finite fuels. 
Solar power provides us with an incredible opportunity to replace electricity and governments should definitely increase spending on research in this field. The theories discussed in our lectures, like Simpsons and Greys, are so vague and lack proof, so I don't understand why we even study them. I see what you mean. I don't like learning unsupported theories for exams and I'd rather spend my time learning something else. For example, I'd be much more interested in studying the animals in safari parks than researching migratory birds, particularly the effect of tourists on the quality of life of animals. As we know, every year thousands of visitors will drive in their own vehicles or ride in vehicles provided by the facility to observe freely roaming animals. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Especially those animals living in more tropical countries like Borneo. Following on from that, I want to study how bringing animals over from foreign countries to put in our zoos affects their life expectancy. For example, do you remember when China sent pandas to Edinburgh Zoo? Apparently, one of the pandas became depressed, but it was never explained why. To me, obviously, you can't take an animal out of its natural habitat and put it in a cage on the other side of the world. It just doesn't work. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a biology lecture about tubularia. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 31 to 33. Hello everyone. I'm glad so many people have shown up here today to hear about these fascinating little creatures called the Turbularia. My name is Dr. Baker, and I've spent 20 years researching thousands of different species of platyhelminths, what are commonly known as flatworms, both free-living and parasitic. So there are a lot of things I could tell you about these extremely interesting invertebrate, but I will try to keep it short. Turbularia are unique amongst flatworms in three ways. The first one is that, unlike 80% of all platyhelminths, turbularia do not need to secure nourishment from a living source. This means that they do not generally parasitize a host, but are instead found living freely in the environment. So, no need to worry about any of these little samples I've got here escaping and causing havoc. The second way in which they're different is that they are, well, they're incredibly simple. And by simple, I don't mean in terms of structure, as their structure is indeed quite complex, and I'll get to that later. By simple, I mean that they're not the brightest bulbs in the box. Flatworms in general are not known for their cognitive abilities, especially when compared with other invertebrates such as cuttlefish or octopuses or even insects. But amongst flatworms, turbularia are by far the most primitive of the bunch. Finally, and this is a direct result of the first thing I mentioned, turbularia tend to have a much more complicated sensory system in their head region. This includes a set of eyes with receptors that can detect light, as well as chemical sensory organs that assist turbularia in locating food. Obviously, as other flatworms receive nutrition directly from their host, they have no need for this. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 34 to 38.
Despite these three differences, however, turbellaria are quite similar to other flatworms in all sorts of other ways. First of all, as their name suggests, they're incredibly flat, which allows them to hide under stones. They're symmetrical on both sides, and they don't have a body cavity. They also don't have any specialized respiratory, skeletal, and circulatory systems. What they do have, however, and this is what I meant when I referenced their structure before, is three layers known as the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm, as well as a head region where their brain and sense organs are located, and a spongy connective tissue that fills all the space between their organs. Finally, like most species of flatworms, they're hermaphrodites. This means that a single flatworm has a set of each gender. But don't take this to mean they reproduce alone. Their preferred method of reproduction is called cross-fertilization, which means that each flatworm fertilizes the other. I mentioned before that most flatworms need a host, but turbellaria feed from the environment. So what do they feed on? Most turbellaria can be found either in fresh or salt water, and they feed on small insects, microscopic matter, and crustaceans. They will pretty much eat anything they find. They have no preference on whether their food is living or dead. Also, and this is the most remarkable part about their eating habits. Also, and this is the most remarkable part about their eating habits, if they ever find themselves in a situation where food is scarce, they might also feed on themselves. That's right, they'll start eating their own body, starting with the least essential muscles and organs and working their way up. They will shrink in size until they're able to find food again, at which point they'll begin to regenerate everything they've lost. One final thing about food, and apologies in advance if I disgust you, turbellaria don't possess an anus, which means that their mouth, which is a muscular opening on the underside of their body, has to serve as one. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 39 to 40. Before I finish this presentation, one more thing you've probably heard before but weren't sure if it was a myth or not. I mentioned already that turbellaria can reproduce on their own, but there's a second method they can use, which is known as fission. Now, as a child, you were probably told that if you cut a worm in half, it will grow into two new worms. That's not entirely true, but flatworms are not worms exactly, and they do have the ability to regenerate by splitting into two perhaps even more smaller parts, at which point each part regrows the missing organs and becomes a brand new turbellarian. Now this is extremely important for us, and this is how I'd like to close this presentation, because their ability to regenerate endlessly makes them virtually immortal, and it might open pathways to regeneration in human cells or slowing the human aging process, which is why scientists like myself have been studying these unique creatures hoping to get some answers. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more videos.